2 Corinthians chapter 3. And you know what I really see in this chapter? It's a chapter all about letters and windows. You say, what? Yeah. Believers are pictured in 2 Corinthians 3 as living letters, letters that are alive, and wonderful windows. Windows that are amazing, what you see as you look in them or through them. And also, as we read this morning, I hope you also noted the contrast between the law of Moses and the new covenant that we have with Jesus. The law of Moses is referred to as the old covenant. The new covenant that we are the recipients of, we receive the benefits from, I should say, is uh, far superior. And that's what 2 Corinthians 3 and the contrast as it reveals the difference between the two really focuses our attention on. It's a chapter of contrast. So let's pause a moment and then we'll look at uh, living letters, which is a description of the believing life of the church. And then we'll look at wonderful windows, which also is a description of believers and the church of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just so thankful this morning that we have the Bible. We know that it's unlike any other book because it is the Word of God. It did not come because men just chose to write down their thoughts. But as we are taught, holy men of God were moved, were carried along by the Holy Spirit of God, and they wrote they spoke and they wrote what we have as scripture because of your filling them and your guiding them and you inspiring them. And we thank you for that. And so, Lord, whenever we open the Bible, we open a unique supernatural book and it ought to have real weight in our lives as we look at it and as we listen to it. And so we pray to that end. We pray, Lord, that you would use your word to give us a view of Jesus that would uh, transfigure us, that would make us more like him, that would cause us to be drawn to him. Perhaps there are those that would be listening that need to receive Jesus. They need to have him as their savior. They need to receive him into their heart, into their life. But those of us that have already done that, we need a fresh transfiguration of our hearts, of our lives this morning, this day, as we meet together and ask this for the glory of on the behalf of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So the first six verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul uses that uh, metaphor of a letter. But he begins with a particular type of letter. And uh, it was a letter that was used in ancient times. It's used currently as well. Periodically, as a pastor... I am called upon by people to uh, write for them a reference letter. Maybe they're applying for a job and they need a reference and they ask me to write a letter of recommendation for them, which I do. Or perhaps they are applying for citizenship and they need a recommendation uh, from a pastor. And so I write that for them. Or maybe they're applying for some type of educational scholarship and they need a recommendation letter and whatever. There are times when I am and perhaps you have been called upon to write a letter of reference or recommendation for someone. 
Well, that's the kind of letter that Paul's talking about when he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Do we have to do we have to recommend ourselves to you again? He had done that in the chapters before. Or do we need as other people as others that want to replace us, do we need epistles or letters of recommendation, reference letters to give to you? Letters that, or letters of reference or recommendation from you? That's his question in verse 1. Do we need a recommendation letter, a recommending letter? Okay, well, here it is. Verse two, you're it. <laughs> you want a reference letter from me? You want a recommending letter from me? Well, look at yourself then. You are my reference letter. You are my rec letter of recommendation. You are our letter, he says, written in our hearts. And you are known, you're a letter that's open. You're known and you're read by all men. People can look at you and they can see the ministry that I've had among you. That's what he's saying. You want a recommendation, a reference letter for me? Look at yourselves and realize that everyone that looks at you, everyone that observes you can recognize the fact that I have had significant ministry among you. That's what he's saying here. He's talking about successful ministry. In fact, he says in verse 3, for as much as you are manifestly or you are clearly declared to be a the letter or the epistle of Christ. You're not only my recommending letter. You are a letter of Christ. You are a recommendation letter for Jesus. That's what he's saying in that third verse. We simply were ministers. We simply were the means whereby the message of Christ came to you. He did the work in you. He says, you're a letter not written with ink, but you are a letter that is written by the Spirit of the living God. And here's the first contrast. Not in tables of stone. Doesn't that remind you of the Ten Commandments? That's what he's referring to. You're not like the Ten Commandments engraved in stone by the finger of God, but you have had the Spirit of the living God engraved in the soft, fleshy tables of your heart. Yes. Jesus. Yes. And that's the recommending letter. Yes. And that's Paul's apostolic recommendation. You want me to have a recommendation, reference letter as an apostle? It's your changed lives. It's your lives changed here in the city of Corinth. You know what the evidence is? You know what the, the, the validity of real ministry in a local church or among a group of people is? It's that very thing that those people's lives in that local church begin to look more and more like Jesus. That they, their lives are living letters that recommend Jesus, that recommend Christ to all who observe them. That's what he said. You know, the, eval the proper evaluation, do you have evals? on your job where you get evaluated every once in a while for your performance? <laughs> well, you know what a proper evaluation is for a pastor's ministry or for anyone in ministry? It is the level of spiritual life and devotion of the congregation. So if your spiritual level and your devotion to Jesus is low, I'm a complete failure. I have at least failed in your lives. 
the final test for any ministry when it's over, when it's complete. And you know, someday we'll all be done with ministry. Someday I will not be pastor at Bethel Baptist Fellowship. And when my time here is complete, when it's finally over, my ministry here, the spiritual life of this congregation that I leave behind will be the true mark of any spiritual success that has been had. The realization of spiritual success is, as he says it here, look at it with me in verse 4 and 5. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. How can I know that there will, that there will be spir, a, a level of spiritual devotion to Christ? Well, it's not because I think I've done a good job, but it's because of the trust that I have through Christ for God to do the job, to do the work. And then verse 5, because not that we are sufficient of ourselves, to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And what he's simply saying, I realize that any successful work that is accomplished in a congregation like this or at Corinth or anywhere is the work of God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the fact that the Spirit of the living God has done a work, not outwardly, not externally, but internally in your heart, on the fleshly tables of your heart. He has worked an inward change that eventually becomes apparent outwardly, but it's first inward. Amen. And that's what he's saying here. Your, your letters, your recommendation letters, Amen. not of me, only, but utmostly, ultimately, of Christ. And he says in that third verse, you are the letter of Messiah. You're the letter of Christ. He calls the church not only his recommendation letter, but he calls the church Christ reference letter. Every believer, you one, every believer Every church is a living reference letter for Jesus. And your life and this church is read as a, recommend, as a recommending letter by a watching world. And what they see in you and what they see in us as a whole forms their opinion of Jesus. That's what he's saying. That's pretty serious stuff. That means you just can't sit back as a spectator. That means that it's got to go deeper than outward. It's got to it's got to penetrate your soul. It's got to be an inward thing. It's got to be spiritual. To be successful, it has to be spiritual, deeply spiritual. It it necessitates lives that are transformed. It's a sober thought that people judge Jesus by what they see in our lives, yes. by what they see in you who claim to be a Christian and what they see in us who are a church. That's a sobering thought, but it's fact. That's what he's saying here. I wonder what kind of a reference letter for Jesus are you as an individual? I wonder what kind of a recommendation letter are we as a church for Jesus? To a watching world. And I should remind us, the world is watching. And you know why? Because they're searching. You may not think it, but all this garbage that's going on in our culture is that it's people searching. They're looking for something to meet the deepest need in their heart. And they're looking in all the wrong places, obviously, Amen. but it, it, uh, it indicates there's a real searching going on among people. Amen. They're watching because they're searching. Someone said it this way. You're writing a letter. You're writing a gospel, a chapter a day. 
by the deeds that you do and by the things that you say. And people read what you write, whether faithful or true. Just what is the gospel according to you? We have the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's the gospel according to you? How do people read the gospel when they view your life? When they view our lives? You know, <laughs> this is a kind of a, a crazy illustration, but we have an, an old beat-up church van. It was nice when we got it. It's an old beat-up church van right now sitting out there. And you know what? I refuse to put our church name on that van because I know how I drive. And I don't know how you drive, but other people would be driving that thing. And do you think that I wanted that church van to be advertising Bethel Baptist Fellowship by the way that we drive? Not too good. <laughs> you get my point? People are watching us because they're searching for truth. And you are a recommending letter, whether a good one or a bad one, you're a recommending letter. Here's another contrast. Look at uh, verse 6. Who, Jesus, or God, also made us to be able ministers. Again, he's not taking credit for any, any spirituality, any devotion to Christ in the church at Corinth, and neither am I for any spirituality or devotion in this church. He says, it's God. Our, we can't do it. Our sufficiency is insufficient. Our sufficiency is of God, who made us able ministers of the New Testament, of this new covenant. Not of the letter, that's the old covenant, the letter of the law. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter, the law of Moses, it kills. But the Spirit, which is the new covenant, it gives life. That's what verse 6 is saying. A recommending letter, your living letter. And then there is the condemning law. The law kills, he says in verse 6. It's that contrast between the living letter versus the stone-cold dead law. It's a contrast between the condemnation and death that the law brings versus the rightness and the life that the Spirit of God brings. Look at verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation, that's code word for the law of Moses, the Old Covenant. It was a ministry of condemnation, but it was glorious. It had glory attached to it. Well, how much more the ministry of righteousness, that's the new covenant, the New Testament, is called a ministry of righteousness, and of course it far exceeds in glory because of that. The condemning law. You know, I think we get mixed up about the law of Moses that God gave to the Jewish people. Law of Moses... It was and is, it's worthy. I mean, it reveals, when you read the Torah, if you read it correctly, you know what you're seeing? It's a revelation of God's holy character. It's an unfolding of who God is, his glorious character. But you know what else the law, you know the purpose of the law? Not just to reveal the character of God, but in light of that, to reveal the sinfulness of man. And the Bible tells us that God gave the law so that we would understand what sin is and how sinful we are. You know why? Not so that you're stuck there, but that as a result of seeing the holy character of God revealed in the law and thus your sinfulness when you, when you compare yourself to him, that you run to Christ that you run to Jesus, that he is that schoolmaster, the, the law is that schoolmaster that is to bring us to Christ because Christ fulfilled all the righteous demands of the law for us. And so 
the law is to reveal our sinfulness so that we run to Christ. The weakness of the law, it's called something that kills, something that brings condemnation. Well, it's weak because what happens is that human beings, being uh, wired as they are, strive to keep the law. And when you try to keep the law, when you try to keep the Ten Commandments, when you try to live a good life, you know what it does? It leads to despair and it leads to death. It kills. It's a killer. Maybe that's the real silent killer. The spiritual silent killer. Trying to keep the Ten Commandments. Trying to keep God's law. It leads to despair because you can't do it ultimately. And it leads to death. It kills. The letter without the Holy Spirit enlightening it and enabling us to keep it kills because the law doesn't remove sin. It reveals sin. It condemns sin, but it offers not one ounce of ability to obey. And that's why it's deadly. It kills. That's what he says. It's a condemning law. All right. So the difference between a living letter, a living recommending letter, and a condemning law, okay? So let's flip the motif here from a letter to a window. And we pick it up in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 3. And uh, we've already read that. I'm not going to uh, detail it. But he says, if the ministration of death, the law of Moses, that was written and graven in stones, that's the Ten Commandments, if that was glorious, and it was. It was glorious. I mean, you can go back and read the scene where it happened. Exodus chapter 32, 33, and 34. It was glorious when God gave the law on those stone tablets to Moses. You remember Moses, from that time, the 40 days that he spent on that mountain getting the law from God, when he came down, his face was actually glowing. His face was shining. And it was a reflection of the glory of God in whose presence he, he had spent 40 days. And so the children of Israel, they couldn't look at that face of Moses. It frightened them. And Moses put a veil over his face whenever he spoke to the children of Israel because his face was frightening, glowing. And then he says in verse 10, even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. What he's talking about is simply this. When you compare the Old Covenant with the New Covenant, there's really no comparison as far as the glory is concerned. The glory that you and I are the recipients of in this New Testament era that was inaugurated by the death and sacrifice of Jesus on that cross and then really ratified by his resurrection, there's no comparison with what happened with the Israelites on Mount Sinai versus what happened with Jesus on Mount Moriah when he gave his life on that tree. Verse 11, for if that which is done away, and the old covenant, by the way, the Jewish people haven't got the memo. It's been done away with. It's been replaced. They don't understand that. It's been done away with. It's been done away. Even though it was glorious when it was given, it was done, it's done away with. Much more that which remaineth, the new covenant, the new testament, is more glorious. Because it doesn't fade away. It doesn't, it's not temporary, it's permanent. Verse 12: seeing then that we have such hope, we use plainness of speech, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now let's talk a moment about 
you and I, not only being a living letter, but a wonderful window. Drop down to verse 18. Behold, we all, that's New Testament believers, with an open face, with an unveiled face, unlike Moses, with an unveiled face, we behold as in a glass God's glory. That glass, to me, is a window, a wonderful window. In that window, we receive the glory of God. Through that window, we receive the glory of God. And uh, we then reveal that glory. Our lives are not only letters, they're windows that reveal the glory of God to anyone that looks through the window of our life. That's what he's saying here. <laughs> It's a contrast, again, between the law of Moses, listen to me, and the life of Jesus. A contrast between the law of Moses and the life of Jesus. I've already read to you the contrast there in those verses. Look at uh, verse 14. But their minds, well, in the context, he's talking about the children of Israel, verse 13. Their minds were blinded. For even until this day, when Paul wrote this letter, wrote this epistle, and we could say, and now 2,000 years later, to this very day, even unto this day, there remaineth that same veil untaken away. There's, as Moses veiled his face and the children of Israel could not see the glory of God, were blocked from seeing the glory of God because Moses had this curtain, this veil, this mask on. So the Jewish people. Then, in the first century, 2,000 years later, in the 21st century, that same veil is not upon Moses' face, but it's upon the heart of the Jewish people as a nation. That's what he's saying here in that 14th verse. In fact, that same veil, he says, is untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses, the Torah, the five books of Moses that begin our Bible, even this day when Moses is read, that veil is upon their heart. You know, as a street light fades before the light of the rising sun, so Moses' law was a temporary reflection of God's glory, but it fades because the law of Moses was replaced by the life of Jesus. You can't compare the two in glory. The law of Moses is replaced by the life of Jesus. And like Moses' face temporarily glowed with God's glory, it gradually faded away. And so Moses hid his face so that the people couldn't see the glory of God and they couldn't tell that the glory of God thus was fading from him. And what he's saying here is that Israel as a corporate nation, has their understanding of the Torah shrouded, veiled, masked, you know what, with what? Rabbinic tradition. With the traditions that the rabbis, the Jewish sages came up with. That's the shroud. That's the veil. That's the mask that covers the heart of the nation of Jewish people. It's so sad because it can't be penetrated. There's no reflection of the glory of God in it. That's why Jesus told the, the Pharisees of his day, search the Torah, search your scriptures, for in it you think you have life, but it is that which testifies of me. They don't see Messiah in it, because... They've been blinded by rabbinic tradition. 
So here's a window with a big curtain in it. Judaism is a window with a blackout curtain in it. You know, we have our, our living room windows. We don't have mini blinds. We have curtains. They're thick curtains. But they're not blackout curtains. And I tell my wife, you know, you need to get curtains that when you shut them, no one can see anything from the outside, not even light. Well, guess what? That's the kind of veil, that's the kind of curtain that is on the heart of Jewish people nationally. Judaism has a blackout curtain on their heart, and no light can penetrate it. The glory of God can't penetrate that. And so there is the law of Moses that is replaced by the life of Jesus. Now pick it up with me. Look at verse seven, uh, 16 to 18. Nevertheless, but even though they have this blackout curtain on their heart, the Jewish nation in Judaism, nevertheless, when it, that is when the Jewish nation turns to the Lord, that blackout curtain, that veil will be completely removed. And you know what? That, that day is coming. Zechariah chapter 12 prophesies that there is a time when the nation as a whole, at the end of that, uh, that uh, great tribulation, the nation will cry. They'll mourn for Jesus whom they pierced. When he appears, they'll call for him. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And they'll mourn over him. Grace and supplication from the Spirit of God will be poured upon the Jewish people and that blackout curtain will be ripped away and the glory of God will shine in unto them and they will repent as a nation and they'll be restored. It's a tremendous, tremendous hope. It's really a picture Verse 16 is a picture of corporate Israel being restored, being saved. It's exactly what the Bible says in Romans chapter 11, that the deliverer will, be, will appear from Zion, and then so all Israel shall be saved. The curtain will be taken away. They'll see it. The old covenant, the law of Moses, that rested on the people's obedience, and they couldn't obey. That's why it condemned them, and it condemns anyone that tries to do it. That's why it brought death to them. It brings death to anyone that tries to live according to the law. That's not it was what, what it was for, but it rests on obedience. Moses' masked face really represents self-effort to please God. That veil, that mask that Moses walked around with in front of people that gave him status with them, that mask actually represented the self-effort that people use to try to please God. The New Covenant, the New Testament that believers are the recipients of it doesn't rest on obedience it rests on acceptance on faith it is a heart that is uncovered look at verse 18 with open face with unveiled face we behold it's a it's a it, it's a heart uncovered so that the glory of god penetrates it and their lives unfadingly shine and glow the greater glory of the new covenant over the old covenant the ministration of the spirit the ministry of the spirit it's the holy spirit it's the life of jesus that the holy spirit puts in you and constantly streams his glorious life in you and through you you want to talk about live stream that's it it's the Holy Spirit streaming the life of Jesus continually in you so that it can stream through you to others. 
This is what he's talking about. This is the glory of the ministration of the Spirit compared to the law of Moses. It's the Holy Spirit enabling you to have plainness of speech. Look at verse 12. Seeing then we have this hope, we use plainness or boldness of speech. He makes the truth. The Holy Spirit makes the truth sink in. So what he says in verse 13, unlike the law of Moses, we have plainness of speech. We have boldness because we understand what the Jewish people couldn't understand. And it is, I'm telling you, it brings liberating power. Look again in verse 16 and 17. When that veil is taken away, and by the way, it could be the nation of Israel, I think, in the context, but it could apply to an individual, whether Jew or Gentile. There are people that have the, they're, they're blind. They have the, the blackout curtain on their understanding. The Holy Spirit removes that, and the light shines in. Verse 17, now the Lord is that Spirit. The Spirit of God is Lord. He's divine. The the the. Spirit of God is Lord, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's liberation. The Holy Spirit of God, this ministry of the Spirit, he makes understanding plain. He illuminates, and then he gives boldness. The truth sinks in. We're able to, to articulate it, and, and there's liberation that comes. Not just corporate Israel being restored, but individuals being saved. When the Holy Spirit removes that heart covering and the Bible meaning becomes clear and you're freed from the law's demands and the law that brings death and the law that causes you always to be defeated and, uh, and you're given new desires. You know, it's like Jeremiah says in chapter 31, and he says that in the new covenant, it's going to be so different from the law of Moses, from the old covenant. In the new covenant, I'm going to write my law in your heart. I'm going to put it in your heart. And uh, you're going to know in your heart who I am. You're going to know who I am and, and, uh, and how to connect with me. You're going to have a personal relationship. It's going to be a heart relationship and not an external one. It's liberating. It's law of God in your heart, and it releases the liberating power of Christ's life in your life to do God's will so that you refuse to do what you want to do. You know, that's what Christian liberty is. It's not the freedom to do whatever you want. It's the freedom to do what God wants you to do. It's liberating. And then that last verse, and folks, if you have to go to the bathroom or if you have to do anything else, Get it done because I want you to be here for verse 18. This is really the climax of this message. The life of Jesus is not only liberating, but you know what verse 18 tells us? The life of Jesus is transfiguring. It's transfiguring. What's that? What does it mean to be transfigured? Well, go back in your mind to Jesus when he has Peter, James, and John up on that mountain. We're not told what the mountain was, where, which one exactly. It doesn't matter. But what matters is what happened on that mountain. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 17 that the, the outward form of Jesus began to shine as bright as the sun. It's called transfiguration. Yes. Transfiguration, the word means that your outward form, your outward appearance, totally changes. That's what happened on that mountain. What Jesus was doing was he was giving those three disciples just a, a, a little glimpse of who he really was. The God of Mount Sinai, the God of glory, 
and he allowed his glorious deity to shine as bright as the sun out through his human flesh and blood. He was transfigured. That's exactly what verse 18 is talking about. Did you know that the word changed in verse 18 is the same word that is translated transfigured in Matthew 17 and verse uh, 2? where it says he was transfigured before them, as I just described. That's what the word changed means. Same word. It's translated changed and not transfigured here in verse 18. And here's what I want you to realize. The life of Jesus, that through the Spirit of God, is streamed into your life and through your life is a transfiguring experience. The glory is revealed in the life of the Jesus that dwells within you through his spirit. The Holy Spirit moves in you and he works in you. And notice what it says. We all with an unveiled open face beholding as in a window, a glass. The believer stares at is what it's saying the believer uh, is to stare at the unveiled glory of Jesus with an unveiled face and see Jesus in all his glory and experience his presence and as a result understand who he is and trust him to do his work in us and through us transfigures the believer when you behold Jesus and I'm and and it's the scripture where you behold him when you behold Jesus with an unveiled face you get a glimpse of his glory you get in his presence what he's teaching here is that you are transfigured into Jesus's likeness that word transfigured that is here translated changed is the word that we get our English word metamorphosis from. And metamorphosis is a process in science where one form turns into another form. Where a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. And so when you behold the glory of Jesus that the Holy Spirit streams into your life and through the word of God, you understand who he is and what he does. There is a, a metamorphosis that takes place when you depend upon him to bring about that transfiguration in your life. And it lets people see Christ through you as a transparent window into your life. They see Christ through you. They see the glory. They see the shine, the transfigured Christ in your transfigured life. Notice what he says here. You're transfigured into the same image, that is, into Christ's likeness into his image. You're transformed, you're transfigured, you're metamorphosized into the same image of Jesus. Notice, from glory to glory, literally from one degree of Jesus' glory to a brighter degree of his glory, to a brighter degree of his glory, to a brighter degree of his glory. What's it saying? It's saying that while salvation is a gift of God that happens at a moment in time, sanctification or growth in the Christian life is a process that happens over a period of time where you become more and more and more and more like Jesus. Now, here's the thing that I really want you to catch today. Are you ready? When he says that we as looking or staring or gazing as in a glass, modern translations 
they translate that word glass by mirror. But I'm glad that the King James Version didn't use mirror and uses glass. Because all a mirror does is reflect. And I'm not saying that we don't reflect Jesus. But it's more than a reflection that he's trying to teach us here. He, it's more than a reflection. It's that when Jesus' life is streamed into your life and you depend upon his life, his life is revealed inside of you and then it radiates outside of you. That's more than reflection. It's radiation. Like a window. You look through a window and it reveals what's inside. Okay, look through the believer. The believer's life is a wonderful window. You look in their life and you see Jesus. But also, did you know that windows radiate heat outside? They do reflect, but they also radiate heat. I'll give you this illustration. My sister she had all her windows replaced in her little house, and she, she got these energy-efficient windows, which you can see through them, but they have material that, uh, that causes the sun to not be able to pass through a normal piece of glass, but rather it causes the sun to, to be, um, I don't know the word, but it... it, it causes the sun to be reflected out and not into the room. So they, they keep the house a little bit cooler, just the windows themselves. She had this problem. She, her car is, is, uh, is parked right near the front of the house in front of these windows. Nothing wrong with that. But what she went out there one summer day and uh, you know how car mirrors are now enveloped in plastic? Used to be when I started driving, it was, they were all metal. <laughs> now they're all enveloped in plastic. She went out one day and the mirrors on her car were all melted. And she didn't know what, what happened. She took her car to the service station and they figured it out that she had parked close to the windows in her house, and those energy-efficient windows had caused the sun to be reflected upon her mirrors and melted the plastic around her mirrors, and they were useless. She couldn't move them. I say that to say this. This is what it means to be transfigured. When you are transfigured, as verse 18 is talking about, when you with, with an unveiled face behold the glory of the life of Jesus and depend upon his life in your life to flow in and through you, you are transfigured so that you not only are a window that people can look into your life and see Jesus, but your life radiates Jesus as heat from that, uh, from that reflected sun out to their lives. You impact people. That is, unless your window has a blackout curtain on it, unless you have a blackout curtain or a veil on your life that obscures Jesus inside of your life, you have a blackout curtain that, that blocks all outside from seeing what's on the inside. I read about the fact that on a, on a wall near the main entrance to the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, there's a portrait, and it has this inscription. Let me quote it. James Butler Bonham, no picture of him exists. This is a picture of his nephew. Major James Bonham is deceased, but... His nephew greatly resembled his uncle. And so this picture is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died here in the Alamo for their freedom. 
you might say this, there's no literal picture of Jesus that exists. But the life of Jesus can be seen through the window of your life or through the letter of your life. Amen. And as you experience his presence, you understand who he is, and then you depend upon him for what he himself can do. He, he can transfigure you and work in and through you. You see how important it is that Jesus lives in you? And you recognize that? And let it fulfill the purpose for which he has moved his residence into your spirit. Our Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would use this to awaken our hearts and help us to deal with any curtains, any veil that we have over our life. It could be sin that we haven't dealt with. It could be our own selfishness, our self-life that blocks out Jesus because everyone looks at us and they just see us. They don't see Jesus. Everyone that talks to us, even when we talk about Jesus, we always talk about ourselves. And we obscure a view of you. Lord, I pray that you would just remove the veil Remove the veil from our faces and remove the veil from our lives that we would see you in all your glory and that you would transfigure us and that others would see your glory as they look through the window of our life, as they are impacted by the radiation of your life from ours as they read our lives as a letter of recommendation. Your head's bowed, your eyes closed. Perhaps you're not the reference letter that God intends you to be. There's some things in your life that are not recommendable, that don't resemble Christ, a real Christian life. Are you willing to admit that, acknowledge that, and deal with that today? Does that matter to you at all? Or perhaps you're a Christian that you, you're masked up. You have a veil. You have a veil over your face. You just read your Bible just to read your Bible. You don't, you, don't, you don't read it to see Jesus. You just do it to check off I've read today. Or perhaps you have a veil over the window of your life. Because... There are things that you know need to be dealt with and you have that you haven't dealt with them. And so as a result, you got a blackout curtain over your your the window of your life and people they can't see Jesus in you because of that. You're just being hypocritical. You're just pretending that everything's okay between you and the Lord, but there's a there's a veil. You're masked up. Your window's closed with a curtain. You need to deal with that today. You need to deal with it. That's what God's brought you here to do. And he can, he can rip that curtain down. He can take that mask off of you. He can remove the veil from your face and from the window of your life so that the glory of Jesus shines in you and through you. Let them do that today.